with me, if you will, to the book of Luke, chapter number nine. Uh, some time ago, I started thinking about key passages of Scripture that have shaped my spiritual growth, my discipleship journey, my leadership development over the last 32 years since I've come to faith and surrendered to the call to ministry. As I started thinking about that, there was something that ignited in my spirit. Like if those passages of Scripture have been this transformational to me, they would probably add value to you. I started thinking deeply about what some people would call life verses, those Bible verses that shape the story, the narrative, the direction, and the pattern of our everyday lives. So I decided to do a sermon series on some of my life verses. A couple weeks ago, I preached from Romans 12.12. 12. It's one of my all-time favorite passages in the Bible. Today, I want to point you to another one of my life verses. And I would dare say you will probably never hear another person refer to this particular phrase of this particular verse as one of their life verses. As a matter of fact, you may live your entire life and never hear another sermon preached on this particular passage of Scripture. But it's so important to me that I want a paraphrased version of this verse included as the epitaph on my grave marker. At first glance, it's not all that profound. It says in Luke 9, 15, and they did so. That's it. And they did so. Doesn't seem all that powerful. But when you start realizing who they are, and when you see what they did, and you understand the circumstances in which they did it, you begin to understand the power of irrational obedience. Now, let's look at that phrase in its context. This whole passage is one of the most famous miracles of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000. And this story, the feeding of the 5,000, is included in all four Gospels. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but it is the only miracle of Jesus other than the resurrection that is included in all four Gospels, which says something to us about its significance. Right before this happens, Jesus had just empowered and sent out the 12 apostles. He said, you've seen me do these things. I want you to go out and do them. And he sent them out into ministry. And they are now returning to him with reports of all that God had done. So we pick up now in verse 10 of Luke 9. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. This miracle, a miracle that most of us grew up hearing about our entire life, the whole miracle, the whole story hinges on the irrational obedience of the disciples. And they did so. I mean, think about the context of their obedience. And when you start thinking about it, you'll understand why it was so irrational. The Bible says there were 5,000 men. More than likely, they had their families with them, but only heads of households were counted in that day in censuses and the normal counting of crowds. So more than likely, there would have been as many as 15,000 or more hungry people that had now gathered in that desolate place. And all they had to work with was a little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish. Now, the little boy is not mentioned anywhere in Luke's account, just the contents of his sack lunch. 
As you read the story in all four Gospels, each writer includes details that the other writer don't and, or doesn't. And so you can start piecing the details together. John chapter 6, in John's Gospel, he tells us about the little boy. And that was the contents of his lunch, the five loaves and two fish. John also includes a conversation that Philip and Jesus had that Luke doesn't include. It's a conversation where Philip complains to Jesus about not having enough. In John 6, verse 5 through 7, Philip basically says, and I'm going to summarize, Philip basically says to Jesus, there are too many people to feed, and even if there were somewhere for us to buy enough food for all these people, we don't have enough money. So they're in a desolate place, they're in a desperate situation where their need is far greater than their resources. Can anybody relate to ever being in a situation like that? You ever found yourself in a desolate place or in a desperate situation where your need was far greater than your resources? I have a stirring in my spirit today that a lot of us listening to me right now, a lot of us in this moment are in that place as I speak. And if that's you, then pay attention to what Jesus commands here and how the disciples respond to that command. Jesus looks at the crowd, he looks at his disciples, he looks down at the five loaves and the two fish, and then he says to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each, as if he's about to serve 15,000 meals from five loaves and two fish. Here's the problem. We all know how the story ends, so we don't feel the tension that the disciples were feeling in that moment. We don't personally feel the difficult place that this put these men in because Jesus' command was irrational. It didn't make sense. And because we know already how it ends, we don't value the incredible level of trust, the incredible display of faith it took for the disciples to obey in this situation. Most of the time we give these guys, the disciples, a hard time, and rightfully so, because on so many occasions, these 12 men were clueless. I mean, when you read the Gospels, it's almost like they messed up on every page. They fought with each other. They were prideful. They didn't listen well. Jesus told them the same thing over and over again. They were hard-headed. But this time, in this moment, they got it right. When Jesus said, have them seated in groups of about 50 each as if he's about to prepare a meal, they didn't say to Jesus, Lord, didn't you hear Philip? There's nowhere to buy food. And if there was a place, we don't have enough money. They didn't take Jesus back to math class and remind him that five loaves and two fish don't add up to 15,000 meals. Once the command was given, they didn't argue. They didn't try to make it make sense. They just obeyed. Luke 19, 14, Jesus said, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Verse 15, and they did so. That's the power of irrational obedience because on the other side of this act of faith, Jesus performed what might be his most well-known miracle. On the other side of this act of irrational obedience, the hungry were miraculously fed. On the other side of this act of faith, in a desolate place, in a desperate situation, God took little and made much out of it because as the song says, little is much when God is in it. When everyone had eaten, the disciples actually went around and started collecting the leftovers. And when they were finished collecting the leftovers, there were 12 basketfuls of food left over. Because on the other side of irrational obedience to God's commands, you always end up with more than you started with. There are three key principles I've already mentioned. I've either read them or specifically mentioned them in, in, in my conversation so far. But I believe the Holy Spirit wants them branded on our hearts today. So in case you missed them or they weren't clear enough, let me just make sure you got them. Number one, I want you to see the value of the desolate place. There is no chance for a miracle until a miracle is needed. 
But too many of us spend our lives doing everything we can to protect our comfort, doing everything we can to avoid suffering or inconvenience at all cost. Too many of us try to live safe, riskless lives trying to maintain the status quo and manage an image. Now, most of us as believers, we would say we want a burning bush encounter with God. We just don't want to walk through the wilderness to get to it. But the burning bush was in the wilderness. God has to get us to a wilderness, to get us to the end of ourselves before we can ever experience him for who he really is. It takes valleys, it takes wildernesses, it takes desert places, desperation, and total dependence before we ever get to a place we can see him for who he really is. God knows that. So he leads us, allows us into desolate places. I mean, listen, it's in John's gospel very clear. Remember that conversation that Luke didn't include, but John did, Philip and Jesus? John chapter 6, verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Listen to this. He asked him this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You get that? They're there on purpose. The whole crowd, the desolate place, the treasury empty, not enough food, nowhere to buy food, not enough money because he wanted to get them to the end of them. He wanted them to need something greater than than what their gifts could supply or their talents could supply or their own resources could supply. He brought them to an impossible situation to show them that he is the God of the impossible. There is value in your desolate place. And I believe with all my heart, if you lean in and obey him, you're gonna meet God in your desolate place in a way that you have never met him before. Your desolate place is the breeding ground of the most miraculous revelation of God that you have ever known. There's value in the desolate place. Here's the second thing you have to see. You play a role in your own miracle. Did you pay attention to what Jesus said in verse 13? The disciples come to Jesus with this impossible situation. Big crowds, hungry people, nowhere to buy food, no money. And they make all these problems and the impossible odds. And they just put the onus all on Jesus. They dump it all on him like, what are you going to do about this? But Jesus puts it right back on them in verse 13. He said to them, you give them something to eat. You've got some responsibility in what's about to happen. So what are you going to do? So they immediately start explaining why they can't. They start magnifying the problem. They start talking about the odds stacked against them. And they let the need in the desolate place overwhelm them while they forgot who is standing there with them. Jesus says to them, when he he says to them, you give them something to eat, that was actually an invitation for them to be a part of something miraculous that was about to happen. They could not supernaturally multiply the little boy's lunch and turn it into enough provision to feed 15,000 people. But they could trust him enough to obey and have the crowd seated in groups of 50 each. If they would do the natural thing, he would do the supernatural thing. If they would do what only they could do, then he would do what only he could do. And it's not just in this story. It's a pattern throughout the scripture. It's a pattern throughout Jesus' ministry. Every time Jesus was about to perform a miracle, he requires an act of obedience from the people or the person in need because irrational obedience is one of the greatest and deepest expressions of your faith. Now, I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but there, every time Jesus performed a miracle in the New Testament, he asked something. It was a... Um, an irrational request, a command, and the miracle only happened after irrational obedience. Let me just point out a few. In John 5, Jesus tells the lame man to take up his mat and walk. He's been laying on that mat his whole life. What's different today than yesterday? How how can I take up my mat and walk? That's an irrational command. On the other side of his irrational obedience, he walked. In John 9, he tells the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He had been blind his whole life. He had washed in that pool over and over again. It was an irrational command. But when he he irrationally obeyed and went and washed in the pool, he was healed. Mark 3, he tells the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. 
well, the reason your hand is, you can't stretch out your hand, your hand's withered. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational. But he attempted to obey, and it says his hand was made as whole as the other. In Luke 17, he tells the 10 lepers to go show themselves to the priest. Well, they didn't want to show themselves to the priest because of their leprosy. They were religiously unclean. It did not make sense. But the scripture says it wasn't the priest that the miracle was about because Luke 17, 14 says, as they turned to go, they were healed. As they turned to go. Irrational obedience to an irrational command set a miracle in motion. John 11, at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus said, take away the stone. And here in Luke 9, he tells his disciples who don't have enough food or enough money to have this group of people seated, all he's got, five loaves and two fish, go ahead and have them sit down and prepare for a meal. Have them seated in groups of about 50 each. And they did so. In these cases and in every other case where Jesus performed a miracle, he always gave a command. It was an irrational request that required irrational obedience. He was testing their faith. He was basically saying to them, do you trust me enough to obey? Every one of these requests was an invitation to set a miracle in motion. Their obedience would become the catalyst. They could now be a part of something supernatural that God was about to do. No, I can't raise Lazarus from the dead, but I can't move a rock. No, I can't feed a multitude, but I can obey and prepare a meal, prepare for the miracle by having them seated in groups of about 50 each. If you will do the natural thing, he will do the supernatural thing. If you will do what only you can do, he will do what only he can do. Some of us are in need of a miracle today, and we're sitting around waiting on God. But maybe, just maybe for some of us, God is waiting on us waiting on us to obey, to move the rock, to take up the mat, to stretch out the withered hand, to write the letter, to ask for forgiveness, to make the call, give the gift, walk across the room and share your faith. Irrational obedience to the nudges and the commands of God set miracles in motion. The old hymn says it best, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Here's the third thing you need to take from this story. I just said it, but I want you to see it. God sees irrational obedience as the highest or deepest expression of your faith. So you see, it's not just a pattern with Jesus. It's the pattern throughout Scripture. Irrational request, irrational obedience, miracle. Follow me in Luke uh, or in 2 Kings. Uh, there are three chapters, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 of 2 Kings that chronicle the ministry of the prophets. I'll start in chapter five. It tells the story of Naaman. Naaman was a very powerful man. He contracted leprosy. He comes to the prophet out of desperation because he wants to be healed. The prophet tells him to dip in the river. It's a dirty, dirty river, very powerful, fluent man. He tells him to dip in the river seven times. There was almost this argument like me, dip in that river, but he obeys. He wasn't healed on the seventh or the, or the third dip or the fifth dip. He was healed when he obeyed, came up out of the river on the seventh time. Irrational command, irrational obedience, miracle. You look in chapter four, it recalls the story of a widow whose young sons were about to be thrown into a debtor's prison because of her late husband's debt. She has nothing of value in her house but a small jar of oil. The prophet tells her, Go to all your neighbors and borrow as many vessels, containers, as you possibly can. She gets them all. He goes into a room. He reaches out of the room, grabs a vessel. It's filled with oil. He reached out to get another vessel. She said, that's all I got. He said, all that you have provided is full. Sell the oil, pay the debt. There's enough here for you to live on. God met her at her level of obedience and expectation. If you'd have got four more jars, he'd have filled four more jars. Ten more jars, he'd have filled ten more jars. When the jars ran out, the oil stopped. Irrational request, irrational obedience, supernatural supply. In chapter 3, you have an alliance of three kings that have joined to war against Moab. Moab is one of the, um, the most difficult nations dealing with God's people in the Old Testament. All the allied troops are trapped In a valley, their animals, the troops, are trapped in a valley surrounded by Moab. No way out, no water. They're going to starve. 
So the kings go to the prophet Elisha and say, inquire of the Lord, we need water. So Elisha prayed, said, these people that are doing your bidding, Lord, they need water. Here's what God's reply was, tell them to dig ditches. If they'll make the valley full of ditches, I'll make it full of water. They dug ditches and God filled it with water. Here's the issue in today's modern church. We have a lot of water wanters and not enough ditch diggers. Everybody wants a shortcut to a miracle. They want to sneak up to Santa Claus. They want to get their genie and their three wishes. They want their miracle and they want their water. They just don't want a Lord they have to obey. But God says, if you want your valley full of water, then first make your valley full of ditches. Dig the ditches, I'll fill it with water. It is faith expressed through irrational obedience. Yesterday I was thinking through some of the journey Haley and I have been on, our church has been on. I got emotional because 16 years ago this month, we responded in irrational obedience to God in a way that had started becoming normal for us and has been a pattern of our life, but it was one of the most significant moments of our life. I became the pastor here 17 years ago. I was 31, Haley was 29. We had been pastors here eight months and the church had started to grow in another location. It was a smaller, we were rated for about 400 people at a time and, and uh, we, we didn't abide by that. <laughs> we packed them in, but uh, we were going three services and we had started a Saturday night, three on Sunday, one on Saturday and we were getting citations from the city because we were blocking the roads and parking, parking on, the, and we just started begging God, God, you got to give us a home. You got to give us a place. We have a vision bigger than our resources. We ask, you believe you're asking us to do something greater than our current surroundings. We don't have any money. We don't know what to do. So we started dreaming. We felt like God told us he was going to build us a house that would house his glory and what he wanted to do in people's lives. We started dreaming of this place here in Saxe. Didn't know where it was going to be, didn't know what it was going to look like, but we were living in the reality of that dream. So Haley and I said, you can't ask people to do what you're not willing to do. you got to lead the way. And I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? He said, I want you to give me everything. I said, Lord, I gave you everything. I gave you my life. No, he said, I, I want you to literally give me everything. After some months of praying, we came to the conclusion he was asking us literally to take everything we owned of value, push it across the table, give it to the church. On July the 9th of 2006, we rented the Curtis Colwell Center. It was, it was the Garland Event Center at the time and had combined all our service together in just this incredible moment of vision. And Haley and I deeded our home over. The title company came. We deeded our home over to the church that day. And the Lord had told us to empty our retirement accounts. We've been married 15 years at that time. Our kids' college savings accounts, our savings and checking accounts zero them out. We literally even went through the couch cushions and got the, the change out of the ashtrays. That was a last minute thing. We just like, he said everything. So we got all the nickels and the pennies and the quarters and we brought them all. We shoved them on the altar on July the 9th, 2006 in that arena. Woke up on July the 10th. And literally, no, 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 we started our lives over. No two nickels to rub together. It was the scariest season of my life. One of the most incredible seasons of my life watching God provide. And standing here in this room today, 16 years on the other side of that, if it hadn't have been for that act of irrational obedience and a host of other people who joined us in their own sacrifices of faith, we wouldn't be in this room right now. And as I'm preaching now to Wiley and Men and Hughes and Garland, I think about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. I didn't even know to think about having a church in Wiley or Garland or or I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I wasn't smart enough to dream that way. And here I realize all these campuses are the fragments, the bags, the, the, the 12 baskets that are left over. Because when you walk in international obedience, you always get more than you bargain for. And we're just going to keep up picking, picking up the baskets. And who knows where we'll be next. People called us fools. Uh, literally, most people gossip behind our back. Uh, but some people to our face called Haley a fool, me a fool. You say, Pastor, what did you say to them? Well, the ones that talked to us to our face and called us fools, we just basically said we live by the adage of martyred missionary Jim Elliott who said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's incredible. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So 
a few years ago, it was another irrational act of obedience for me. I was praying in my office at the old location on 3rd Street. And I felt like the Lord asked me, I've never heard an audible voice in my life, but an idea that wasn't for me popped in my head, sign a contract, okay? But I want you to put the signature page on the front, okay? Why? I start thinking. When we sign contracts in business with men, the signature page is on the very back because we want to make sure we agree to all the terms. We want to have our attorneys look it over because we don't trust people. So the signature page is on the very back. The very last thing you do is sign after you've agreed to all the contents, all the small print. God said, I want you to put the signature page on the front. So I got 10 pages. I, I, I printed out a big, bold, yes, Lord, a signature line and a date over 15 years ago. It says, yes, Lord, with an exclamation. I signed my name on the signature line and I dated it. The last nine pages are totally blank. Because when it comes to God, I don't have to read the small print. It doesn't matter what the next nine pages, it doesn't matter what he asks, the answer is already yes. I trust you, God. I'll go, I'll do, I'll give, I'll say, just tell me. Back to the epitaph. I still have that contract, I live by it every day. Yes, Lord, to whatever. I'm your currency, you just spend me however you want to. Back to the epitaph. At the end of my life, end of mine in Haley's time in ministry, I could care less about people thinking we were great leaders or great preachers or great business people or great in anything. The thing that would matter to me most is that we lived our life in such a way that on our tombstones, it would say, in marble or granite, God asked and they did so. So what's he asking of you today? You're sitting around waiting on a miracle. Maybe he's asking something of you. Take up your mat, stretch forth your hand, move the stone. I feel like in response today to this word, we need to sing an old hymn of the church that basically is a song of surrender to trust in Jesus. And I wanna do something different. This is gonna be unique, it's gonna be different today. We're gonna to sing it together, but at all of our campuses, in just a minute, I'm gonna ask all of our campuses to stand. When I do, some of you, this word is for you today. And this is gonna be a very, just, there may be many other things God asks of you in, in the days ahead and that are irrational obedience. But today I'm gonna to give you something really easily and subtle. If you're in a desolate place and you're in a desperate situation and you need God to touch you, this is a very simple act of obedience. God, I hear you, I know you're speaking to me. This is taking up your mat today, dipping in the river seven times, moving the stone. When we stand to our feet, if this is for you, I just want you to step out of the nearest aisle. You need a miracle, you're in a desolate place. I want you to come stand around the front. And all we're gonna do, we're gonna sing the song as an act of faith and then we're gonna go. So in Wiley and Garland, when we stand here in Saxe, I want you to move to the nearest aisle. If it's you, if this is you, and I want you to come to the front. God, I'm gonna trust you. I wanna set a miracle in motion today with obedience, irrational obedience. And we're gonna sing a song about that. And then I'm gonna pray for you and we're gonna walk out of here. So would you stand with me all over this place, Garland, Wiley, and if God's talking to you, would you just come? Just come stand down here. Like I need, I need a miracle, I'm in a desolate place, I'm in a, a, a desperate situation, and I'm, this, I'm stretching my hand. This is my, my act of obedience today. Is, this is me, I'm taking up my mat, this is it. I'm, 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 I'm going to borrow my vessels today. This is what I'm doing, I'm acting in obedience today. Come to the front of the campus there in Garland. Come to the front of the campus there in Wiley. Just gather, they're coming here in Saxon. If you're at Hughes, come on, gather in the front there. You need a miracle today, whatever it may be. We're gonna sing this live at every campus, all right? And campus pastors, you, have, you pastor the moment there after this song is over. Saxy, you know this. Sing this song as an act of surrender to God. He sees your movement, he sees your heart. Now make this song of the church your prayer today.
understand the depth of burden represented at this altar in these aisles today at every campus at North Place. But you see them. I, I, I see expectant mothers here worried about unborn babies. I see parents with infant children here needing a miracle for their kids. I, I see couples and financial needs and physical needs. And Lord, we sang it a moment ago, your names say it all. You are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. You are Jehovah Nisi, the God that goes before us as our banner. So Lord, would you make the crooked way straight? Would you make the mountains a plain? Would you do the impossible? As your people respond in obedience to you, may the legacy of irrational request and irrational obedience continue to lead to the God of the impossible at work in people's lives. Lord, I ask that testimonies come out of this moment. I sense yesterday, Lord, in a time of prayer that you wanted this short, small, sacred moment to do something significant in the lives of people in this church. So I ask you, would you do what only you can do? And would there be a testimony that would come from this moment that would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus? Father, would you bless them? And would you keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? And turn your countenance their direction today and grant them peace. In Jesus' name, amen.